Good evening, everyone. I'd like to say a very special welcome to you this evening, joining us for our mini law school on disability, human rights, and the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. I'd like to extend a sp very special welcome to uh, Minister Leonard Pereira for joining us this evening. And um, of course, you are included in our special guest list. Uh, my name is Andy Vine. I am the manager for race relations, equity, and inclusion at the Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission. We hope to have a really interesting evening tonight. And without any further ado from myself, I'm going to call on David Shannon, my and our director and chief executive officer of the Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission. Welcome, David. Thank, thank you, Anne, and uh, I think it's, it's uh, wonderful to uh, be able to be here uh, with, uh, with everyone, and I'll be uh, very brief. Uh, as uh, some of you may know, uh, Dean Brooks uh, unfortunately can't be here today, so I get to uh, speak on my own behalf and, uh, and on, on behalf of Dean Brooks. I can say as uh, the director of the Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission what, how very thrilled all of us are to see everyone here also to partner with, um, with Dalhousie Schulich School of Law and uh, the work with, um, uh, with all of the community partners to be able to uh, be here tonight. To see the wonderful turnout this evening tells me a great deal about interest in the Convention of the Rights of People with Disabilities. Also at large, the interest in human rights in Nova Scotia and Halifax and the and the role that the CRPD can play in galvanizing that interest in human rights and looking toward creating a framework for greater inclusion for people with disabilities makes me very happy to be here because I am a, a Dow Law alumnus. And I think the, that was uh, some time ago that I came to Dalhousie. And uh, I think of them being able to include me uh, as, a, as a student in the law school at a time when people with disabilities were barred, barred from law schools right across North America, barred for practical reasons because there was no physical access, barred for some of the invisible reasons related to, uh, to accommodation, barred for a host of reasons that meant that people with disabilities could not aspire in their academic aspirations could not aspire in their employment or their life aspirations. For me, Dalhousie Law School created that framework. And I think the CRPD, in the discussions we will hear today, creates a framework for what is now one billion people in the world with disabilities. The World Health or Organization estimates there is now a billion people with disabilities globally. Well. The CRPD is not going to be the immediate panacea. It's going to create the framework, though, so that those persons can have families, go to school, live the kind of fulfilling life that Dalhousie Law School has, was the model for me and has been the model for other people with disabilities. And so I think it's very important and very inspiring to know that here, here we start the discussion on the CRPD. Secondly, it's a momentous year, and this is a momentous year. Last year was supposed to be, as you will hear, because last year the federal government was supposed to submit its report on the CRPD to the experts committee under the CRPD. Well, the federal government never did that in 2012, and here we are into March of 2013 and they still haven't done it, so I'm still staying optimistic that this will be a momentous year that the report will be written. However, it will also be very important for all of us as NGOs, academics, and others across, across Nova Scotia and Canada to write a shadow report. In other words, we should respond to the federal government. And if we're going to succeed at that, the, we're going to need community engagement. This starts, tonight starts the process of that community engagement so we can get the necessary input and we can respond to the federal government's report when it comes. So tonight, we look forward to uh, 
the discourse beginning, the, disc, the, the level of discourse continuing to heighten and develop around the CRPD and, um, and many, many, uh, and ultimately what we're really here for, and that is a continued, continued greater and fuller inclusion for people with disabilities around the globe and in particular to address the, address the particular, the, uh, the necessary plan of action for Nova Scotia. So thanks, I'll hand it over to our fine speakers tonight. Thank you very much, um, David. Uh, I just want to quickly introduce Tammy and Shane who are interpreters for this evening. Uh, tonight, we have a group of distinguished uh, speakers and experts in the field of um, disability and human rights, and they will be presenting to us. Um, I will be keeping very strict time, and um, we've chatted about that, so if you see me, don't be you know, too worried. Um, so, tonight we would invite Steve Este um, to come and address us firstly. Steve is the chair of the International Committee the Council of Canadians with Disabilities. So, um, Steve, we'd like to invite you to the platform. Okay. Folks, hear me okay? Where are you going to be with your signs, Anne? Right so here. Sure to see them. <laughs> Good evening. It's great to see such a big crowd of people here tonight. I'm excited to be here and to share with you for a few minutes a little bit of the background. I think that some of the other speakers are going to talk about the substance of the convention this evening. I wanted to take a few minutes and give you a bit of a history behind it because it just didn't appear one day at the UN, somebody with a document that says, here's a convention about the rights of people with disabilities. It took us a long time to get to that. So I want to talk for a few minutes about that, maybe set a little bit of a stage. Really, there are two streams of events that took place at the UN over the course of the, from the founding of the UN up until the convention came into force, that kind of converged in the convention. I want to talk a little bit about those. First, very quickly, talk about international human rights and the development of international human rights law. Because as you know, the UN was founded after the Second World War. Countries came together and talked about the atrocities of the war and said, we don't want to go through these kinds of things again. We want to find a way to work together in peaceful coexistence and protect the rights of people around the world. So one of the first things that they did in 1948 was they agreed upon a document called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That's a kind of foundational document of the UN, and it sets out the basic human rights that all people have. It talks about the right to assembly, the right to elections, the right to not be locked up, the right to worship your the God of your choice, all of those basic human rights that we all know and understand. So that document came about in 1948. And after that, nations of the world talked about kind of refining their understanding around what these rights looked like. And there was a process to develop two things called covenants. First was a covenant on civil and political rights. And the second was a covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights. Very simply put, those things are the whole substance of the Universal Declaration. Do you think about the covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights? I always think of it as a document that talks about the things that government should do. They should provide you with an education. They should provide you with access to health care, those kinds of things. Whereas the other thing, the covenant on civil and political rights is more the kinds of things maybe that government shouldn't do. They ought not to lock you up and throw away the key. They ought not to prevent you from moving across borders as you see fit, those kinds of things. So you have that kind of background 
then those three documents together are called the International Bill of Rights, International Bill of Human Rights. From that, the UN system began to look and elaborate more in detail about specific kinds of populations. And through the 1970s and 80s, they looked at the idea that there are certain groups in society that have perhaps challenges in realizing these civil rights, and they elaborated conventions on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women, and Convention on the Rights of the Child, and the Convention on, and I've written this one down, Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. So you've got these kind of thematic conventions that evolved after the Bill of Rights conventions. So you have that kind of human rights background or framework, if you will. I want to just set that aside for a minute. How am I doing for time? Hmm? You're doing very well. Hmm? Oh, you're not five minutes uh, I better be fast. Five? Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm afraid of Anne. That's why I'm checking all the time. <laughs> Against this background of this international human rights framework, you have at the same time a process at the UN of an evolving understanding around disability things. But that happens in the kind of, I would think of it as disability policy and programming in the UN system. You see that stuff starting off in the early 1970s. So sometime after the human rights discussions, there were begin to be discussions about disability in the UN system. In the 1970s, it was very, very preliminary, some discussions about uh, some provisions of rights for people with intellectual disabilities and so on. But it began to get on the radar screen. In the mid-70s, they decided that they would set up a thing called the International Year for People with Disabilities. And that was in 1981. So the UN set up this year, and they said to countries around the world, you can celebrate people with disabilities in whatever way you wish. And we want to hear about that and exchange information about it and so on. So 81 happened and had some small celebrations. There wasn't really a lot of energy around it, but it did happen. And the important thing about it is that it kicked off a process because when the UN bureaucrats got together to think about this, they said, hey, that year was a great thing. So what are we going to do? Well, if a year was a good thing, why not have a decade? So we'll have a decade of people with disabilities, and that's what they did. They declared from 1982 to 1992 the UN Decade of People with Disabilities. And some of you, like me, are old enough to remember that, and I lived through that UN Decade. And the interesting thing about it, the important thing about it is that with these decades come various milestones and benchmarks the mid-decade, in 1987, there was a mid-decade conference that was held in Italy. And at that mid-decade conference, people with disabilities gathered to talk about the progress of the decade and so on. But all that happened against the background we were talking about, the, uh, the development of, of these thematic treaties, the Convention on the Rights of the Child and things like that. That was happening at the same time. So disabled people said in 1987, hey, maybe we need to have a convention on the rights of people with disabilities. So the first call for this was in 1987. It didn't go anywhere. But at the end of the decade, they called for it again. In 1992, they called for a convention again. It didn't happen in 1992 either. But what did happen is the government of Sweden felt badly because it didn't go forward. And they said, we need to do something about this. So they set up a process to develop a thing called the Standard Rules for the Equalization of Opportunities for People with Disabilities. Whew, a long title. <laughs> but those standard rules in 1982, or 1992 came forward, and they kicked off a process that got people talking more in the UN system about this. And in 1998, the can the Committee of Econ on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights adopted a general comment that talked about the human rights of people with disabilities. And this is a very important, pivotal moment because it's the first time in the UN system that they equated 
people with disabilities and human rights in an official document. So it's 1998 that you see the launch of a process that leads us to the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. Very quickly, in the 30 seconds that I have left, say <laughs> from that 1998 document, we have a process that the High Commissioner for Human Rights sets up a process of study then two academics surveyed countries in the world to talk about the situation of people with disabilities and human rights. That study called for a convention on the rights of people with disabilities. And it was from that study that the government of Mexico introduced a resolution in the UN General Assembly in December of 2001 to initiate the process of the ad hoc committee, which gets us to where we are today. And I think that is probably over time. Thank you for your indulgence, Madam <laughs> Chair. That's a quick background to the CRPD. Thanks very much. OK, I can't show my favoritism anymore. <laughs> OK, our next speaker is, um, oh, thank you very much, um, Steve, for that very energizing presentation. It was um, very passionately presented. Um, our next speaker this evening is no stranger to us, Professor uh, Archie Kaiser, here at the Schulich School of Law. Professor Kaiser, will you come to the podium, please? Shouldn't clap before I speak. <laughs> Anticipation. <laughs> I'll just get my notes there. Critical message. Can we do that? The um, circulated for you? Uh, yes, yes, yes. There's only 50 copies. That's of that. okay. So, well, thank you to all of you for attending this evening. I, I recognize that I'm making two of the organizers uh, nervous, um, and I frankly delight a bit in that. Uh, it's because they think the combination of a law professor, a 27-page international human rights treaty, and 44 PowerPoint slides uh, may not fit in with 10 minutes. Now, <laughs> are my slides ready to go? I'm ready to go. Um, oh, oh, oh. Where are you guys? Are they ready to go? Actually, you should just give yeah. a click on. Well, you know, I, I'm sort of technologically I'm challenged, too. so this isn't counting in my time. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, you've got it. It's one of these, right? Which one, Archie? Uh, well, let me see. That one? That looks like mine, yes. Wonderful. Yeah. Can we make it full screen? Yeah. There we go. Now I'm officially starting. Okay. <laughs> so, let's get to uh, uh, the heart of it. Um, that was the outline. Um, I want to talk about why um, this is uh, significant. It's the first 21st century human rights uh, treaty from the United Nations. Um, and as I've noted here, there was no prior treaty that specifically dealt with the rights of persons with disabilities. It was rapidly negotiated with a high level of participation by persons with disabilities. Uh, and it was greeted with and remains uh, uh, a document that has created unprecedented enthusiasm. Um, as Steve mentions, um, it has been seen as finally empowering the world's largest minority. And now we have 155 signatories and 129 ratifications to the treaty itself. Canada ratified it uh, in uh, uh, 2010. Why is it significant? Uh, it reflects a new world consensus on the nature of disability. And I can't emphasize how significant that is. Um, the CRPD imposes a wide range of obligations on the state's parties uh, to ensure uh, that uh, all of the rights enshrined in the CRPD are uh, uh, actually implemented. It requires ongoing vigilance by state parties to ensure that uh, it's implemented and monitored. And it requires the participation of persons with disabilities. So it's significant as well because it links protections of individual rights uh, with broader entitlements to positive rights, such as the right to live in the community, the right to health, the right to work, the right to an adequate standard of living, the right to participate uh, in political, public, and cultural uh, life. 
The Government of Canada has said, and this is crucially important for our country, that this treaty and Canada's ratification of it embodies a shift away uh, from a charity and medical model, model approach towards a human dignity approach to disability. And the United Nations itself says that this marks a paradigm shift in attitudes and approaches to persons with disabilities. They're no longer to be seen as objects of charity, medical treatment and social protection, uh, but rather as subjects who have rights, who are capable of claiming those rights and making decisions for their own lives. It gives universal recognition to the dignity of persons with disabilities. So, in the slides, which are also going to be available on the website, I'm told, uh, you know, so that you can have them, I go through the differences between you know, the perspective of the disability model or the social model uh, and the medical model. But crucially here, uh, we see that in this graph um, that from the medical model's perspective, the focus is on the impairment and the individual. But from the social model perspective, the disability model, the focus is on the social context and the environment. So uh, then the question becomes not how can we cure you as an individual, how can we fix you? Uh, the question is more because disability is constructed by society. The question is, as at the bottom there, how do we prevent and alleviate social discrimination? How do we resist the domination of persons with disabilities while moving society towards understanding disability in a progressive manner? So it has transformative potential. You know, this convention, because of its widespread acceptance in the world community and because of the model that it imposes on all of us. The medical model still has a place, you know, but it fits in as part of the broader kinds of rights that people have. The rights of persons with disabilities to the maximum level of health, not, you know, the medical model being imposed upon people. So what is disability? You may well ask under this uh, uh, convention. And this is a critical understanding that we all have to achieve here. Disability under the convention is not defined precisely, but there are several articles which give us an indication of what the world community now thinks about disability. And basically here what we see is that the question is, you know, when persons have impairments, um, what are the attitudinal and environmental barriers that hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others? So that the concern is the removal of barriers. As Article uh, 1 says, uh, uh, sorry, the preamble says, persons with disabilities continue to face barriers in their participation as equal members of society. So, you know, the uh, convention itself is a complex instrument. Um, you know, Article 3 has several general principles, you know, which uh, are often thought of as the moral compass of the convention, respect for dignity, non-discrimination, and full and effective participation, among other values. The uh, value of participation and inclusion is one that uh, permeates this treaty. Um, and we're talking about conclusion, uh, sorry, inclusion in terms of it being a general principle, a general obligation, and a right in many different respects. Um, there are other general principles that we have to think about as well, the principle of non-discrimination, of course, um, and the issue surrounding accessibility. Accessibility very broadly conceived. Um, it's a general principle, it's a standalone article, and access here means access to justice, access to living independently and being included in the community, uh, access to information and communication services, education, health, uh, and an adequate standard of living, among other things. Canada has, like other states' parties, assumed many obligations uh, to uh, ensure uh, that uh, the um, uh, promotion of the full realization of the rights of persons with disabilities will be achieved. So Canada has an affirmative obligation, as other nations do, to adopt appropriate legislation, to modify or abolish existing laws that impose discrimination upon persons with disabilities, uh, and to take into account you know, the, the needs of persons with disabilities in all lawmaking. You can see here that the, the, the convention structure is complicated. I don't have time to go over it. Those are the basic articles. It goes on you know, for two whole pages, just the structure of it. 
I'm going to move on to look at some of the rights in the Convention, and they certainly include some of the ones that you would expect. Equality before the law, right to life, liberty, and security of the person, uh, freedom from torture, exploitation, respect uh, of uh, physical and mental integrity, uh, and some of these will be developed by uh, uh, the people who follow me. There are individual rights, and this is just a sample. Um, individual uh, rights uh, uh, which are interconnected. Some protect people in extreme or abusive situations. Um, others are uh, ones which provide continuous protection in what might be called normal conditions, you know, where we're not dealing with the extremes of, of humanity. Uh, there are also positive uh, collective or societal rights, uh, and I've mentioned them in, in part. Uh, but uh, you know, they include these many rights that are intended ultimately to uh, uh, foster inclusion in society. If all of you were lawyers, and I had much more time, I'd explain you know, uh, the basic answer to this question. Is it law? And I guess the basic answer that I would give is it, it's a form of law. It's meant to influence law in, in our country. Um, Although it's precise legal effects, you know, we'll have to see uh, them evolve. I talk about you know, how Canada receives treaties, whether Canada is transformationist uh, or adoptionist. Uh, but basically, whether or not it's an implemented or unimplemented treaty, which are interesting legal questions, um, I'm going through this rather too quickly, but the uh, major point is uh, that uh, the Convention is going to influence the interpretation of the law and also our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, uh, that uh, they have to be infused with the values of uh, the Convention on the Rights of Persons uh, with Disabilities uh, because it becomes part of our law in that indirect sense at the very least. I've got three minutes. <laughs> I've got one minute. There is a very important debate that I wish I could explore with you about uh, whether, for example, um, the uh, convention prohibits involuntary hospitalization and treatment. I'd like to talk about that specifically because you know, that becomes one of the areas which is most contentious you know, under the treaty. Uh, but uh, let us just say that there are arguments that would suggest that it does prohibit involuntary hospitalization and treatment. At the very least, uh, it imposes the values of uh, a restraint and last resort, if nothing else. Uh, there is a duty to scrutinize all legislation with the spirit of the Convention in mind, um, both because Canada has assumed this obligation under the treaty and because Canada can't have entered the treaty in bad faith. You know, that the Vienna Convention and the, the treaty itself says you can't have reservations or declarations which are inconsistent with the treaty. So Canada has made a declaration in reservation. No doubt Professor Wildman will talk about that in part. Uh, but uh, uh, I don't think it goes so far as some people suggest to undermine the treaty. It can't be read that way. The treaty must be implemented. There must be accountability. Basically, um, the, uh, the treaty I itself has, I believe, you know, changed uh, the world for people with disabilities. Um, the, uh, uh, the treaty uh, is meant to ensure uh, that all of us look at people with disabilities in a different way. Uh, it, it ensures uh, that uh, uh, the disability model will have per pervasive, transformative effects, that the CRPD becomes a baseline for assessing current and future legislation, the CRPD will influence the content of individual rights and broader economic, social, and cultural rights. And Canada will be accountable for its action or its inaction with respect to this treaty. There are high expectations uh, across the world uh, for states' parties uh, to conform with the treaty. And I think that they are especially important in Canada because we are a rich nation um, and uh, uh, because we're a nation that has said that it has a commitment to the implementation of human rights. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the eyes of the world ought to be on Canada as the first report is released. Uh, and uh, uh, I think they may well find us wanting in many respects. Uh, next, you're going to hear from speakers who will zero in on some of the special problems in a, that are associated uh, with implementing uh, the uh, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kaiser, for a very informative presentation. 
Uh, one thing I'd like to quickly mention that, you know, Nova Scotia has got a stake very much in the, in the CRPD uh, because um, Steve Este and um, Dulcie McCollin have been parties to, to supporting and, and to getting this convention going. They have been on the committees, the UN committee for that, so um, it's, it's important that we take note. I'd like to um, introduce to you at this time, um, I hopefully I pronounce her name properly, um, Christine Ogorenta To. Yes, wonderful. Um, Christine is um, Principal Researcher for Mental Health and Human Rights Evaluation Project, and she's with the Mental Health Commission of Canada. Welcome to the podium, Christine. <laughs> okay, let's go to the previous then. Oh, how do we get full screen again? Yeah. Good evening. Um, it's an honor uh, to be here this evening and uh, among such inspiring people. And um, it's a wonderful opportunity to share some of the research that we did. Um, and it's also very timely that we're having this discussion because I don't know how many of you know or are familiar with the uh, report that just came out from the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Torture, uh, which focuses on abuses in healthcare settings. And he states, severe abuses such as neglect, mental and physical abuse and sexual violence continue to be committed against people with psychosocial disabilities and people with intellectual disabilities in healthcare settings. And picking up on what Archie said, in terms of the key, one of the key controversies of the CRPD, uh, there, he says there can be no therapeutic justification for the use of solitary confinement and prolonged restraint of persons with disabilities in psychiatric institutions. Both prolonged seclusion and restraint may constitute torture and ill treatment. So that was just a very timely statement that came out today. And what I'm going to be talking about this evening is uh, some research that was done and it was in, uh, supported by the Mental Health Commission of Canada. I'm not an employee of Mental Health Commission of Canada, but I was the principal researcher on this project. And uh, this project came about um, as a result of the work uh, that Archie Kaiser uh, did along with Cindy Player uh, from the Equity and Human Rights Office at uh, the University of Victoria in British Columbia. And they were the architects of this, this research project and they advocated strongly that research be conducted to evaluate mental health legislation policies and standards with the human rights lens. So uh, myself and uh, my peers at the Public Interest Law Center and Canadian Mental Health Association in the Winnipeg office beginning in April 2009 until November 2010 uh, we conducted research that formed the basis of developing an instrument to evaluate legislation, policies, and standards against key rights and principles that are contained in the Convention on the Rights for Persons with Disabilities. Um, so before I, I say much more, I want to point out that my slides uh, largely consist of images. And these images were taken uh, by people with lived experience, by people experiencing mental illness. Uh, and these images represent for them uh, some of their experiences when it comes to the realization of human rights for themselves. And so this first slide is really showing pictures about barricades and yellow tape and just sort of symbolizing some of the difficulties they experience or have experienced in having their own human rights realized. And you'll recognize the one on the far left is actually the McDonald Bridge here in Halifax. So um, 
when we speak of our main purpose in this project, one of our first tasks was to learn how human rights were defined or experienced according to individuals living with mental illness. This was um, in many ways um, in the mental health sector, we weren't hearing that often in this country anyway, those concepts being brought together. So we needed to learn from people with lived experience what that meant. Um, and so with the experiences of individuals with mental illness, that was our guide, that was our focus. And, so, and that fed into our main pur purpose, which was to evaluate existing legislation um, here in the provinces and the policies and the standards or the, the framework in a sense for human rights here in Canada as related to individuals living with a mental illness and comparing them to the highest standard which is the, is the Convention on the Rights for Persons with Disabilities. So this next slide asks what did we do and more importantly how did we do it and these images are people that we worked with and their support networks. Um, and by the way, uh, the, these images you can find uh, in a photo voice presentation on the Canadian Mental Health Association Winnipeg website. And so there you'll see the pictures and more uh, elaborate stories of, of what those pictures mean. So that's the first thing in terms of what did we do is we formed a group of people across Canada who experience with mental illness and we asked them to share their stories and to define for us what is meant by the term human rights. And we not only worked with these individuals, but we also chose three provinces to focus on, Manitoba, BC, and Nova Scotia. And in, in these provinces, we gathered information about their mental health legislation, their policies, and their standards. And one of the methods we used to gather that information was to conduct focus groups in each of those provinces uh, with people from government, from non-government organizations, people with lived experience, and family members. And we asked them to describe the current status of their legislation, policies, and standards against five key rights. And those were access to justice, liberty and security of the person, uh, freedom from torture, cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment or punishment, living independently in the community, and access to physical and mental health treatment and services. And we also uh, conducted interviews with uh, individuals in Australia, Scotland, and the European Commission as they had also attempted to evaluate their laws against international human rights treaties. So from all of that information gathering, what did we learn? And so um, what part of what we learned is depicted in these slides. So you'll see a picture of an institution and you'll see a picture of uh, chairs uh, all in a row and you see a, a image of uh, a monopoly game where it's about chance or luck. And these are some of the thoughts um, or um, uh, feedback we received from people in terms of what their legislation policies and standards represented for them. This is not to say, I know that se seems like a very negative picture, it's not to say that there weren't positive things going on in the province, it, provinces with respect to programs and services for people living with the mental illness, but rather what we learned overall is that legislation policies and standards are not necessarily linked with each other and above all they are not linked with key human rights that we find in the convention. Furthermore, it is also a commonly shared characteristic across the country that mental health legislation does not go much further um, beyond establishing criteria for involuntary admission, treatment, or substitute decision making. So that existing legislation is focused largely on restricting people's rights, or what some may refer to as negative rights, rather than on positive rights, such as those we find in the C CRPD like the right to live independently in the community, um, including the right to choose uh, housing and the right to a range of in-home and community supports, which we see in Article 19, the right to employment and employment supports in Article, we see in Article 27, 
the right to education and education supports, which is in Article 24, and the right to an adequate standard of living and social protection, or Article 28. We found that there were several policies for mental health facilities, uh, regional um, or district health authorities, some provinces had policies, but they seemed to be more in reaction to events. And they certainly didn't seem to be connected with the legislation and most definitely not connected with human rights. Uh, Nova Scotia was the only province to have mental health standards. Many services are accredited through accreditation standard, uh, Accreditation Canada. But again, those standards from Accreditation Canada aren't linked to human rights. So if we think of legislation and policy and standards as the pillars of um, a human rights framework, those, those aspects are there in Canada, they exist, but really when you apply the CRPD to them, they, they don't uphold uh, or support the key human rights that we find in the convention. So I have one minute. Okay, real quick, where do we go from here? Back to basics. <laughs> so um, keeping it simple in everything that we do, all the meetings that we attend, um, all the uh, discussions like this we participate in, uh, make sure that people that are with lived experience are at the table and actively contributing. Be inspired, look at what the rest of the world is doing. When I went to India and I was uh, going through a psychiatric institution, I saw people lying on the floors, n on the floor next to the beds, and I asked, what's this about? And it was the family members. When, when people are admitted to the institution, the family members go with them. So it's not necessarily we want to do that here, but it's, it's how do we not break that connection between um, individuals and their support systems. We need to keep talking, spread the word, and raise CRPD in all the meetings and discussions you participate in and evaluate. Um, I'm a big believer in evaluation, and through this project, we developed a tool that uh, to evaluate legislation, policies, and standards. I encourage you to look at it. It's on the Mental Health Commission of Canada website, and it's on the CMHA Winnipeg website. So use it to your heart's content. Take from it what you can, chuck the rest, but it's there for, to, for you to use. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christine, for your presentation. It was very informative. Uh, I love the pictures and um, your generosity, of course. Appreciate that. Um, I'd like to invite um, Professor Sheila uh, Wildman from the School at Schuler Floor to come to the podium. Join us, please. Thank you. I'll leave it to you. Right, so my, uh, my topic uh, this evening of 10-minute uh, speed dates with the CRPD um, is Article 12, uh, Equal Legal Capacity, as I'm putting it. And I have, let me see here, three um, objectives. First, I want to um, take a look at what Article 12 has to say about decision-making capacity in law. Um, then I want to ask, building on a core commitment of Article 12, what it would mean uh, to support equal legal capacity. What does this mean? And uh, finally, briefly, I want to look very briefly at um, some examples of Nova Scotia law in light of Article 12, and I conclude there that we have, um, to quote my colleague Diane Pache and others, uh, miles to go. Um, so Article 12, here is the text or an excerpt from the text of Article 12. Um, I provide the full text in the appendix to my slides that I understand will be available after uh, this uh, this session on the uh, Schulich School website. 
Um, so the full text is there. What does it say? Well, the two parts that I've excerpted, I'm actually going to read them in part for people with visual impairments. Um, the first section I'm interested in states that states' parties shall recognize that persons with disabilities enjoy equal legal capacity, sorry, enjoy legal capacity on an equal basis with others in all aspects of life. And the second part I want to look at states, states' parties shall take appropriate measures to provide access by persons with disabilities to the support they may require in exercising their legal capacity. There's more to Article 12. There's statements about legal, legal safeguards that are important in processes concerning legal capacity. But um, I'm not going to look at those right now. As my colleague Archie, Archie Kaiser mentioned, Canada has registered an interpretive um, declaration and reservation that rejects, explicitly rejects any interpretation of Article 12 that would require the elimination um, of all substitute decision-making regimes. Um, sounds like quite a radical proposal, um, but it's a proposal that was taken entirely seriously um, during the process that gave rise to this text. And the text might look kind of bland because it's text, but in fact, uh, behind it is a whole set of a whole set of dramas and fights um, uh, that concerned the participation of persons with disabilities in the negotiation and drafting processes. So these, uh, there's a lot going on behind this text and its interpretation, and we can come back to Canada's reservation perhaps. Um, so Article 12 is drafted against a background of laws, um, guardianship and substitute decision-making laws. We'll look at a couple examples briefly in a sec. Um, laws in many places, uh, including Nova Scotia, that deprive one of decision-making authority and confer that authority on another. That's the substitute. So these laws bring together, on the one hand, what I'm going to say are cognitive-based, based in ideas of what you can understand, uh, in, in the main, they bring together cognitive-based cognitive standards or definitions of capacity and incapacity, and they wed those to models of substitute decision-making. And that's a lot to bring into one idea, but I'm going to come back to it. Um, I'm moving now to a slide that shows that I was once Archie Kaiser's student, and still am a member of his student, because uh, this looks a bit like one of his slides. I was, and it also uses the term a paradigm shift, which he used, and many have, specifically to describe Article 12 and its implications. So it's often been said to require a paradigm shift from the reigning model of substitute decision-making to a new model that's termed supported decision making. And this chart tries to capture the difference um, between these. So where on the left, well, I guess you'd say left-hand side of that, uh, where substitute decision making models position some persons as lacking the internal capacity, think of the word capacity, to make um, decisions. And they respond to that by transferring decision making authority from that person to another. Um, supported decision-making models, on the other side, start with the idea that all decision-making requires relationships and su of support, institutional and other relationships of support. Um, and so against that background, it aims to um, enable uh, self-direction or autonomy, is the right the word for that, within a framework of supports. Um, so the last little bit in that slide, the last contrast, goes to the, what I would term the relational effects of these two models. So whereas the substitute model um, has the effect of subjecting one to suspicion and surveillance and ultimately coercion, this is a big package that I'm throwing together, the alternative model of supportive decision making is meant to enhance relationships of respect um, and empowerment. So this sums up the point, um, and it's the language uh, used by uh, representatives of a group called the World Network of Users and Survivors of Psychiatry. And that was a, a key player, key instrumental group, among many others, um, in uh, assisting in the drafting of Article um, 12. So what does this say? It says, instead of restricting autonomy of those who need extra support to comfortably participate in all aspects of life, the CRPD particular Article 12, requires states to provide access to those supports, to the supports that are required. Okay, so this slide I'm actually going to hasten over, but it's an image of some particular rabble-rousers and, and uh, you know, um, agitators involved in the CRPD process, and the one on the top is a fellow who founded a group called Mad Pride in, in Ireland. Um, and uh, my point with this slide really just goes, the title is political, not biomedical, and that's referring to both the nature of legal capacity in this paradigm shift, 
Um, and it refers to the kinds of um, the action that uh, has to be taken in response to um, legal incapacity. And what am I talking about? Well, let's move to something maybe a little more practical. What would it mean to support decision-making capacity? And what's the state's role in this? So quickly, this is just a partial list um, of essential supports that have been recognized by many. And they include, well, providing a range of meaningful options. That actually enhances one's autonomy and legal, and legal capacity, one might ultimately say. Housing options, um, treatment options, other sorts of options. It was something we have to um, unpack. Um, what else? Assistance under, understanding and exploring those options, as opposed to say, you know, all of us, we've been in a doctor's office and here's the form that goes to your consent and this is all the stuff and, you know, you, we just presume that you, you understand or we really don't care if you do or not. Um, this actually goes to the need to, to explain and make sure there is um, understanding and that might involve a family member or a peer or state provided assistance. Um, assistance communicating a choice, sometimes that is um, the difficulty. Um, and something I've written a little bit about goes to the need for crisis intervention because there are emotional and other uh, barriers to legal capacity in some cases or to, to decision-making ability, let's put it that way, um, building relationships of trust uh, in order to displace coercive uh, responses. Um, I'm actually going to skip over this slide, although it's my favorite, because it tries to spiderweb out from legal capacity to the social and economic rights that are so key within the CRPD. So there are broader structural and institutional societal supports that are necessary to support legal capacity. How am I? Okay. Um, where am I? Okay, so a couple of examples. Um, before I move to Nova Scotia, quickly, just two examples of legal models elsewhere that I'm calling here works in progress around supporting capacity. First, British Columbia's Representation Agreement Act, and this was looked at a lot even during the, the drafting of Article 12. Um, what's supportive about it? Well, I've picked out a few things here. Um, one, it stipulates expressly that capacity shouldn't depend on one's way of communicating with others. That seemed important from what we've seen so far. Second, it allows one to um, appoint someone to assist me, right, with making decisions as opposed to take over um, in specific areas. It also allows me to appoint someone to take over in certain circumstances that this model does. Um, the, the Act also states a test for capacity to make those appointments um, that's not rooted in the sort of cognitive capacities of understanding and so on that traditional models are. So it goes to one's ability to pr express preferences and trust. It's, so think about the relevance of this, and this is why it was drafted this way, as I understand it, um, to persons with intellectual disabilities. They don't have fluctuating capacity necessarily back and forth. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, uh, it's, it's uh, a standard that's intended to empower and give a certain legal authority to people based on um, their way of expressing their agency. That's my tip. Um, last one, uh, it requires substitute, substitute decision makers to respect people's current wishes, not just their prior capable wishes, their current wishes if those are reasonable in the circumstances, and there's much to impact. Uh, unpack there too. Quick caveat, um, I have to add there's deep concerns about the fact that this act does not apply, uh, going back to Christine's um, uh, topic, in cases of involuntary psychiatric hospitalization. In those cases, patients are deemed to consent to their treatment. Is that equal legal capacity? Um, second model from Sweden, the personal ombudsman or PO, and this is a state-funded alternative, as I've put there, to family support, and it's aimed at assisting the most um, uh, isolated and marginalized people. Oh, shoot. Oh, my gosh. I'm down to zero. All right. I'm going to move from that, which is so important, and I'm just going to tell you we can come back to this in um, conversation, obviously, where I was going to go with our critique. Um, exhibit one, our Guardianship Act, which goes to all or nothing, um, capacity or incapacity. There's nothing in it about supporting decision-making. There's nothing about attending to person's wishes um, and so on. Exhibit two is the, also our more limited um, substitute decision-making regimes in hospital. Um, and uh, while these are perhaps a little bit better in their decision specificity, again, they don't address decision-making supports. The Involuntary Psychiatric Treatment Act, I have to make this point in light of equal legal capacity, um, is one that uh, 
imposes a higher standard of decision-making capacity than even under the Hospitals Act. Um, plus, it's uniquely in Nova Scotia, the situation where my best interests can override my prior capable wishes. So a deep concern there. And lastly, in the community, we have separate substitute decision-making regimes that, again, um, don't address decision-making supports. Um, and there are other problems with them that we could talk about. I'll leave you with the example of doctors, emergency room doctors, who are being asked to assess people's capacity to decide about whether to enter a nursing home in the context of the emergency room. And they're saying, how do I, I've got this person under the fluorescent lights and they haven't eaten, and they're in a crisis, and I'm actually deciding whether they're capable of, being, of, of making the decision about entering long-term care. Help me. What am I supposed to do? So I'll leave you with that, and uh, I was going to actually say thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Professor Wildman, for your thought-provoking presentation. Didn't she energize us and get us thinking and what to, to go forward and do things? I'd like to invite Anne McRae to the podium. Anne McRae is the executive director for the first, no, oh, sorry. Disabled Persons Commission. I was going to say the Nova Scotia New Orleans. Thank you. I don't have a PowerPoint, so. Okay. It's great to be here, and I'm sitting in the front, and so I didn't realize how many people there were here. It's a great crowd, and uh, it's amazing to me because I, I, I look across the room and I see, a, a lot of students, which is fantastic, but I also see a lot of people from different parts of my life here, and. Uh, Fantastic to see um, some of the kids my son has gone to activities with here as well that, uh, you know, are learning about the CRPD. And there'll be kids who uh, will grow up with uh, never having not known the CRPD, so that's, uh, that's kind of exciting as well. I was asked to uh, talk briefly about um, how some of us are using the CRPD here in Nova Scotia to try to move some uh, issues forward. And um, as Anne said, I'm the executive director of the Disabled Persons Commission, and we're a, a commission of the provincial government. So we advise uh, the provincial government on disability issues. And we have a commission of uh, uh, 13 people. Um, eight of those are people with disabilities from uh, across Nova Scotia, and uh, the other five represent government departments that uh, 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 have, uh, provide a lot of programs and services for persons with disabilities. So in that case, um, you know, we, in some ways we're exercising what I'm going to talk about in that uh, people with disabilities have the opportunity to be involved in, in, in the political process in some way. But um, I fundamentally believe that um, the only way we're ever going to make any great strides around disability issues is when we see people with disability in decision-making um, uh, places. And uh, we have a f fair ways to go before we're going to see that. But uh, we're really um, wanting to be involved in ensuring that people with disabilities have that um, uh, opportunity to participate in uh, public and political life. So I'm going to talk a bit about w uh, what we've been doing around Article 29. And I'm going to read a bit about what Article 29 is about. And then um, I'll give you some examples of some of the, w the work we're involved with. So Article 29, which is about participation in p political and public life, and it states, states parties shall guarantee to persons with disabilities political rights and the opportunity to enjoy them on an equal basis with others and shall undertake, A, to ensure that persons with disabilities can effectively and fully participate in political and public life on an equal basis with others directly or through freely chosen representatives, including the right and opportunity for persons with disabilities to vote and be elected, inter alia, by, one, ensuring that voting procedures, facilities, and materials are appropriate, accessible, and easy to understand and use, protecting the right of persons with disabilities to vote by secret ballot in elections and public referendums without intimidation, and to stand for elections to effectively hold office and perform all public functions at all levels of government, facilitating the use of assistive and new technologies where appropriate, 
and to three, guaranteeing the free expression of the will of persons with disabilities as electors, and to this end, where necessary, at their request, allowing assistance in voting by a person of their own choice, and B, to promote actively an environment in which persons with disabilities can effectively and fully participate in the conduct of public affairs without discrimination and on an equal basis with others and encourage their participation in public affairs, including, I'm almost finished, um, one, participation in non-governmental organizations and associations concerned with the public and political life of the country and in the activities and administration of political parties. Two, forming and joining organizations of persons with disabilities to represent persons with disabilities at international, national, regional, and local levels. So it's quite specific about um, how we can ensure that people with disabilities can participate in public and political life. So some of the things we've done at the Commission is we col we've collaborated, collaborated with various organizations, but one in particular was uh, the Nova Scotia League for Equal Opportunities back in 2010, was celebrating their 30th anniversary. And we agreed to work together to uh, put on an event where we would focus on um, Article 29, and um, see what kinds of things we could do here in Nova Scotia to, to promote public and political participation of persons with disabilities. And um, so what we did was we held a one-day forum, and in the morning we brought people with disabilities together, and um, we uh, um, had a, a, an expert on this particular um, article educate us about what it means and, and, and how we could um, uh, uh, implement it here in Nova Scotia. And then in the afternoon, we brought together um, government officials, people with disabilities, Elections Nova Scotia, to actually talk about, okay, how do we start to realize this um, article here in Nova Scotia? And out of that came um, several recommendations. Uh, two of them I'll, I'll speak to today in, in terms of uh, having um, been able to move some of it forward. Um, organizations representing persons with disabilities in elections in Nova Scotia worked uh, closely together to ensure that uh, changes were made to the Elections Act, which would make it uh, easier for people with disabilities to uh, be involved in the political process. And, and they did. They did change the Elections Act to make it much more accessible to people with disabilities. And secondly, um, there was a call for uh, the creation of something that uh, women have through the Advisory Council on the Status of Women, which was a campaign school for uh, women, and um, wanted to see a similar campaign school, um, okay, thanks, um, operated or organized for people with disabilities. And um, we've had at least one meeting um, to start putting that in place and I put some money in my budget for next year and so we're hoping um, if uh, we get all our money um, we'll be able to start working on uh, uh, creating a campaign school for people with disabilities. Um, we've also been involved with some work um, at the municipal level. Um, last year we may recall that there were a series of workshops um, um, held across the uh, province to um, encourage people from designated groups uh, to participate in the municipal electoral process. And we worked with those folks to um, create a webinar that was fully accessible, uh, meaning um, people with disabilities who were deaf could participate. We had sign language interpreters um, on the webinar itself. Um, we had it captioned and um, all of the documents were um, provided in alternate formats to people who wanted to participate. And we held two sessions where people with disabilities could participate with um, two session leaders um, to find out how they could uh, participate more fully in the municipal um, electoral process. And we're also now starting to also look at, um, a, a request came uh, through to the commission to start looking at how we could um, improve the participation of people with disabilities in school boards. Um, we know that there are some designated uh, seats um, for people with disabilities, uh, sorry, for other groups. You're distracting me. No, I'm only kidding. Three minutes? Okay. Um, 
we know that there are um, seats designated for, for other groups like African Nova Scotians. And um, so we are starting to look at how can we ensure that people with disabilities have better access to um, being involved on our school boards as well. So that's just to give you some ideas of uh, some of the work that uh, it can be done in terms of taking a specific article and starting to work towards progressive realization of, of what that standard could look like here in Nova Scotia. Thank you. I'm feeling kind of guilty now. <laughs> she finished with three minutes to spare. Um, I'd like to thank you very much, Anne. Uh, you know, one of the things that we can always count on, and we've heard a lot of the theoretical aspect of the CRPD, but Anne is, is a very practical person, very knowledgeable, and um, so thank you very much, Anne, for, for bringing that, um, making it so real uh, for us as it applies to us here in Nova Scotia. Our next speaker um, this evening is Anna McCurry. Um, and it is the Human Rights Officer for Inclusion International. I'd like to welcome you this evening. Okay, good evening. To follow up on Sheila's comment, I'm the last speaker in our CRPD speed dating event. And then we're going to flip it over to you guys to hear from you if you have any questions or comments or things that you want to share. Um, I would also like to thank all of you. There is a lot of you when you get up here. It's great to see this big of a turnout. And to follow up on Dave's comment about being part of a conversation that starts tonight and being part of a discussion here in Nova Scotia about this convention, I'm really honored to be here and thank, uh, thank all of you for having me here. Uh, as Anne mentioned, my name is Anna. I'm a human rights officer with Inclusion International and we are an international federation that represents people with intellectual disabilities and their families. Our member here in Canada, for those of you who might not be familiar with Inclusion International, our member in Canada is the Canadian Association for Community Living and their Nova Scotian member is the Nova Scotia Association for Community Living. So it's nice actually to see some familiar faces in the audience as well. Um, and what I'm going to talk about tonight is about community engagement and really how you in this room and rooms like this around the country are going to make this convention real and meaningful here in Nova Scotia, here in Canada, and hopefully around the world. Probably the number one question I get asked, particularly in countries like Canada, that have very strong human rights frameworks, that have strong equality provisions in their legal frameworks, is why should I care about this convention? And I think Archie did a great job at addressing a number of those questions. Um, so there's a lot of reasons you should care about it. You should care about it because of those reasons, because of the reasons that our panelists have talked about. You should care about it because of the legal obligations it creates in this country and around the world. But also, I think it's important when we look at the what of community engagement and talk about community engagement, the why part and why you should care also links back to the community engagement question. The convention itself was an exercise in community engagement. From the very outset, and again, Archie and some others, Steve, others have touched on this tonight, from the beginning, this convention was a participatory process. We had, by the last negotiating session, there was more than 800 civil society organizations and individuals accredited in New York at the United Nations being part of these negotiations. It was the first time in history that people affected by a convention were that involved in the negotiations of, its, um, of the convention. And really, I think for the first time, this convention pulled international human rights law out of the sole domain of lawyers and diplomats. For the first time, this convention was inclusive of the voice of people that were impacted by those laws. It was informed directly by people with disabilities and by families. It was informed by that lived experience and that was the expertise that was brought to bear in making this convention what it is today. That community engagement shaped the convention that we have. 
Uh, Sheila had mentioned some of the challenges around Article 12. Community engagement, I think, is often seen as this lovely kumbaya moment where we all come together and hold hands and say, yeah, let's do this, it's wonderful. And there was a lot of those moments. But more than that, there was a lot of fights. And that's equally important with community engagement, is making sure that you're able to fight through those issues and work together on things that are really hard. Trying to resolve centuries of guardianship legislation is really hard. You need to have all those voices at the table, even when you're fighting with each other. You're going to get to a better place at the end of that. So the convention is different from the beginning. The convention was so involved and so developed by community. It is that voice of community that has shaped it. So I think it's important that we use that experience to reflect on how do we now make it real and meaningful. As we transition into implementation at a domestic and international level, what's going to, to make the difference? And for me, and I think many people would agree, it's going to be the voice of community. It's going to be people who care, people who are going to speak up. That's what's going to make conventions like this real in our communities. So to touch a little bit around that, how do you do that? Well, we're already doing it. We got the convention this far. You can see a huge community engagement effort here in Nova Scotia uh, back when Canada announced. So it was, the convention was adopted by the United Nations in December of 2006, and it was opened for signature in March of 2007. And Canada, much to the surprise of many of us, said, oh, you know what, we're not going to show up. We're not going to be there. It's too hard. We've got to talk to people. We've got to go to the provinces. We can't make that happen. Collectively, the community stood up and said, that's not okay. Canada was a leader in developing this. Canada has to be there to sign. At the time, the Minister of Foreign Affairs was Peter McKay here in Nova Scotia. His office was inundated with faxes, with emails, with phone calls, with people who got in their cars and drove to Stellarton and said, bud, this isn't going to work. You have to make this happen. And that level of pressure was very successful, and they did it. Canada showed up. So that community engagement has already made a difference here in Nova Scotia and here in Canada. So moving forward from that, what's happening right now? Many of you may not know, you are sitting in Halifax, which as far as I know, is the only city in the entire country that has a mayor that explicitly expressed a commitment to the convention. So what are we doing about that? What are we doing to help him make that commitment real? What are we doing to hold him accountable to that commitment? We have a role in making that happen. That's where community engagement, it's easy to sit back and say, this is what government has to do, you got to do this. We need to be the ones at the table pushing this to happen as well. So what are some things that you can do? Practically, use it. Use the convention in all of the efforts that you are involved in. It's a legal tool for sure, but it's an information tool. It's an advocacy tool. We need to be the ones to give meaning to these words. If you haven't already read it, I highly recommend it. It's a fantastic read, even if it is a very legal document. You can write to the Department of Heritage and they will mail you a handy dandy little copy of it, which is another great way of letting the Department of Heritage know that people care about this, that we're watching, that we want to know what's going on. Frame your issues through the convention. So if you are involved in fighting for education and you are trying to get kids with disabilities into schools, frame that within Article 24. If you are talking about legal capacity issues, frame that within Article 12. You may not be involved in the disability community. So if you're working on justice issues, what are you doing to ensure that Article 13 of the convention on access to justice is being part of your work. So we need to be the ones framing our issues in the language of the convention and really using that framework to advance our issues. Build it into your newsletters, into your presentations, into your conferences. Make sure that you're doing what you can to raise awareness about it. As mentioned, you've got incredible expertise here in this community. Steve Esty was on the Canadian delegation. Dulcie McCallum was on the Canadian delegation. Many of us were in New York throughout the negotiating sessions. There's lots of resources that people would love to help share information about and raise that awareness. Participate in monitoring and reporting. 
this is, and I'm sure I'm down to like zero minutes at this point. Um, but this, I'll end on this one, because it's probably the most important thing that we can do as a community. And again, it was touched on a little bit by Archie and some others. We have a responsibility to engage in monitoring and reporting on this. The government has an obligation to make sure we are involved in that. But I can tell you, governments around the world, and certainly here in Canada, would be more than happy for us to ignore this convention. We need to be the ones who are pushing it forward. We need to be the ones that are demanding that we be included. And one way we can do that is through parallel reports. Canada has its famous non-existent report that it owes to a committee of international experts. That same committee will also take reports from community. So they will take, um, they prefer to have coalitions, preferably at a national level, but they want to hear what communities are saying their governments or the country that they're reviewing is up to. Canada's report, I guarantee you, is going to be a lovely long, long laundry list about all the great things that they're doing. We can help the committee develop the core questions they need to be asking to get a real understanding of what's happening for people with disabilities in Canada. Use it to form a domestic analysis. There's incredible work going on right now around the world about using the convention to analyze budgets. Politicians around the world love talking about what they're going to do. The way you're going to find out what they're actually doing is by looking at the budget. Take the convention and do an analysis of your provincial budget, of a federal budget, and you can use that to hold that government to account. Use it domestically here in Nova Scotia to do a report card. Is Nova Scotia living up to the standards in, these convention, in this convention? Lastly, participate in a global exchange of knowledge. We cannot let our broken service delivery model be our legacy or our main export. People are looking to Canada. They are looking to us to lead the way and to show solutions. We need to be honest that we're struggling and that we need to be doing things better. And we need to be learning from countries that are doing things in new and innovative ways as well. Um, so I will leave it at that and just say thank you very much. I'm excited to be part of this dialogue and I really appreciate being here this evening. Thank you ever so much, Anna. We really appreciate your presentation this evening. Now, we're going to um, do a little bit of moving around and quickly get our um, participants, uh, our panel members, up onto the, the platform here. We've got 10 minutes for questioning, so, um, for, for, for questions, so. Um, Before I go, Anna was kind of, she was right, eh? Speed dating. Yeah. The CRPDP I speed dating. It, I think in some ways it keeps people really interested. Well, I think we'd have had half the crowd if it was a three or four. questions here and hopefully Ian can hear me and um, the first question I have um, for our panel members uh, this evening um, this is um, a question that was emailed to us uh, whilst you're, you're settling in I would like to ask the question of the panel uh, panels uh, response to the following I'm a sufferer of MCS multiple chemical sensitivity in addition to other environmental sensitivities that impede my physical well-being and create barriers to my full participation in society. I understand that under the laws, I should be treated as any other person, disabled person, but this has not been the case for me. I am frequently told that my needs can't be accommodated 
what should I expect under the law when it comes to accommodation for me and others with environmental sensitivities? Okay, who's going to take that? Why not, eh? I'll say something. Feel free to disagree with me if you like. But it, it brings up an interesting point for me, this question. Archie made reference to the idea of a definition of disability in the convention. And there was a lot of debate and a lot of discussion around a specific definition of disability. And if you actually look at the placement of the discussion around defining def disability, it's in the preambular text of the convention that they talk about that. So it's not in a binding piece of the convention. It's in the preamble. And if you look at the place in the convention where it does offer definitions, specific definition of disability is not placed there. What is placed instead there is a definition of discrimination based on disability. And I think that that's a very important distinction that this kind of question lies open because we sat in a room talking about the convention and talking about definition and many people banged their fists on the table and said, you can't have a convention that doesn't define the group of people that you're talking about. But other people talked about the fact that disability is an evolving concept, and, and that's the thing that we try to talk about there. So this sort of question, I think, lies open some of the, the challenges that the people who drafted the convention faced when we were, when we were doing that work. Um, so that's my non-answer to the question. Anybody else care to take a go? Okay. If we can be as briefly as we possibly can, because we'd also like to take a couple from the audience. Well, I guess what I would say is that Article 1 refers to the following concept. It, it, it tells you what persons with disabilities includes, and it says it includes persons who have long-term physical, mental, intellectual, or sensory impairments, which in interaction with various barriers may hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis. So, to the extent that a person with multiple chemical sensitivities would have a long-term physical impairment uh, where in interaction with barriers that their, in, their participation uh, is uh, um, is obstructed, then I would have thought on the face of it that that, that does count uh, like the kind of disability that's uh, protected um, from uh, uh, discrimination um, under the convention. Um, and, uh, you know, there is a duty to provide reasonable uh, accommodations which don't impose a disproportionate or undue burden uh, on uh, um, the situation where the person is trying to fully participate. So on the face of it, I, I would appear to me to be another kind of disability that requires accommodation. And can I add one last thing, which is my, my understanding is that the, the Canadian Human Rights Commission, as well as the Ontario Human Rights Commission, and our Human Rights Commission, as I understand it, here in Nova Scotia, has an, uh, recognized environmental um, sensitivities as a form of disability requiring accommodation. So it, perhaps the question goes to the, 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 the deeper problem, perhaps even deeper problem, of how one makes that right uh, real, which I suppose is something we're all thinking about here tonight. Thank you very much. Yes. Are there any questions from um, the audience this evening? Yes, please. There are two. Yeah. Can you speak as loudly as you possibly can? Um, my question is, given the, the uh, limitations that some of the speakers refer to in international human rights law, and specifically the enforceability of it in Canada, um, what effort, um, what appetite might there be, given that the Nova Scotia government would have approved Okay, um, did you hear that question? Given that um, there has been some limitations to have the um, UN conventions um, adapted into our own laws, uh, is, our government doesn't seem to have the appetite to do that. Am I making that statement clear? Um, so they don't have the legal requirement to do it. But okay. <laughs> but uh, the uh, article. <laughs> 
I'm not used to using this in this classroom, but anyway, the, the, the article that uh, we have all referred to is Article 4 that imposes general obligations on states' parties, and it requires states' parties, including Canada and all of its provincial and, and territorial entities, uh, to, to adopt all appropriate legislative uh, um, measures for implementation, uh, to take measures to modify or abolish existing laws which are inconsistent, um, and to, to take this into account deeply in all policies and programs. So there's a clear legal obligation uh, to adopt that Canada has accepted by being a state's party. So I think what that means is that that needs to be constantly played back to governments, uh, that that's the undertaking that uh, you know, they have solemnly made. Uh, and they're in breach of the convention if they don't. So I, I think the convention is meant to be used as a tool to beat government into submission uh, to, protect, <laughs> to protect the human rights of persons with, with disabilities. Uh, so that, you know, I, I think it's an advocacy tool as well as a legal obligation. And I'm glad we have the minister here uh, tonight and I won't beat him into submission. Uh, uh, but that is the obligation of the government of Nova Scotia looking right at you, Leonard. <laughs> And if I, I, I think if, if my um, CEO hadn't turned in his mic, he probably would have um, said that um, we at the Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission, we are trying to adapt and live the, the convention as best as we can and educate the public about the convention. And just to add briefly to that, um, Canadian law tends to really appreciate the moral authority of UN conventions. If you look, there was a great paper done quite a while ago now, around uh, references to the Convention on the Rights of Children in, um, in judgments that, that came through the Supreme Court and I think a few provincial level courts as well. And what we have found is judges really do like hearing them. And just as a, an example, there was the Gray case in Ontario that was looking at uh, closing the last three institutions in Ontario for people with intellectual disabilities. And the convention was in fact still under negotiation had not had final text, so certainly hadn't been signed or ratified by anyone, and the ruling judge referenced the convention and referenced at the time was Article 15, which eventually became Article 19, on the right to live and be included in the community as the justification for closing the institution. So I think that we've seen even, though it may not have same domestic force of law, it certainly has moral influence on law. Okay, um, David, is there anything that you want to add to this? Thank you. Uh, the other key component is the role that, that we find in our commission we have to play, and that is with the intergovernmental relationships. We, we have a role to play by way of providing the expertise in the policy development that uh, academics and uh, commissions, uh, commissions can provide. So, so the governmental group, we, we, can, we can also advise on the, on the framework that uh, governments can and do follow Thank you very much, David. I'm very conscious of our time, and the person at the other end who conducts um, our, our cart um, has, to, has to, to leave us. He's currently in BC. So um, could I? I believe, I believe that we could, we could um, go continue? further. I had the sanction from Elizabeth Sanford okay. in light of that as well to go until as late as quarter two. But okay, we see that's how, great. How long people have oh. the appetite. Wonderful. Thank you very much. In that case, um, there's a question add, here. Can yes? I just add one thing to yeah. to the question that was that was just asked? Um, I think also um, here in Nova Scotia, the provincial government is, is currently involved in and in working with uh, the disability community around the development of a disability framework. And there's about ten initiatives that are currently underway in which. Um, Governments ensuring that uh, the uh, issues uh, that affect people with disabilities will be um, um, what's the word I'm looking for um, will be you know seriously looked at to ensure that uh, under those initiatives that people with disabilities will be uh, provided for and um, 
the CRPD is 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 critical to that work, and um, working with the disability community, we're ensuring that in each of these initiatives, you know, those articles that relate to the CRPD will be will be well understood by government and will be you know implemented. We hope so. Um, uh, that's another way that uh, the CBR, CRPD is being utilized right now here in Nova Scotia. I have to add one quick word, and then I know we have to get to another question, and that goes to guardianship laws. There have been uh, calls to reform our guardianship law in Nova Scotia forever, <laughs> so it seems. And there was a you know, paper done by the Law Reform Commission in the 90s at some point early on saying that we should reform this antiquated bill, the Incompetent Persons Act, as it's called, and we made a reform to get rid of reference to lunatics, I think, and change that word, but we've not substantively reformed the bill. So maybe the CRPD provides a new incentive to revisit this intractable, intractable um, regime. Thank you. And we have a question here, and then I'll come to you. Are you still interested, uh, Lady Dvergen? Yeah. Yes, are you still sorry, interested? I'm I'm oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, I'm referring to Article 28, which states that um, states, parties, shall provide for the availability, um, the availability knowledge and use of assistive devices and technology. That's part of the article. Um, and I'm wondering how we can move from idea to Ask Anne to, to answer that question, please. Anne McRae? <laughs> no pressure. Uh, it's, um, it's, a really good, it's a really good question, Pat. I think we need to do the same sort of thing that we're doing on some of the other articles, is, is to take that article and to form committees or to form groups uh, to get government at the table as well and to start talking to them about, okay, this is what this article says. We understand it's progressive realization, but we need to start making some real serious progress on this, and what are we going to do? And I think, you know, that it takes um, community, it takes government at the table, and, and, and as Anna said earlier, you know, we all have a role to play to, to, to realize what these articles mean. And I think the work that we... The, the, the model that we used when we started working on Article 29 was an interesting one, and I, and, and I think it can be replicated for any one of these articles. Um, we had, you know, somebody come in who understood how the article had been implemented elsewhere uh, to talk about and educate us as a community about what that article means and how it can be implemented. And then we had, uh, we brought all the various players together to actually talk about what are some of the things that we would like to do here in Nova Scotia to realize this. And um, I know it's not gonna happen overnight, but if we continuously raise it and continuously say, okay, in terms of Article 29, this is what we wanna do, how, it's got, how are you as a government gonna um, implement it? The same process can be used for any article.
Well, I don't know if you have to form another group, but I think you bring those interested people that are interested in that specific uh, article together and start working together. It, it doesn't have to be a formal group per se. It could be through the Disability Strategy Partnership Group if you wanted. It could be through um, a coalition of groups that, 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 that requires um, technical aid. Um, you know, it can be done in a variety of ways, but, but I think, you know, we can, we can utilize these specific articles to, uh, I think, really start moving some of these issues forward that, that have been, as you said, intractable. Um, Anna would like to make a comment. Just to, <laughs> sorry, we're playing sort of musical chairs to get everyone to fit. Um, I think to add to that, a real key feature to the convention is that it's different from any other human rights treaty. It doesn't just say you have a right to employment or you have a right to education. It goes through the conditions that are necessary to make those rights real and meaningful, which I think is why we finally are able to have a rights Dri rights driven conversation about access to supports and services. Um, Inclusion International just completed and launched a global report on the right to live and be included in the community. And the number one thing that we heard from people around the world is they don't have the supports that they need to do it. So I think that it's, as Anne's saying, not necessarily forming a new coalition, but it is about looking more broadly at the access to supports and services, what we're providing. And again, one of the things that we found in our report pretty consistently around the world is what we're doing isn't working. And we need to do a fundamental rethink of what we as organizations are providing in terms of the supports and access to devices that we're doing and sitting down with governments and really doing a rethink of where we are and what we're providing because what, what we've been doing to date hasn't been working. So I think it is using the convention as our springboard into a whole new conversation and really looking more broadly at the supports and services, aids and devices that are needed to facilitate full inclusion and participation. Thank you very much. I've got three questions to take. Um, and I just want to make sure I'm not ignoring this side of the room, so that would be four questions. One, two, three, four. OK, in that order, so please. Hi. Um, as a deaf individual, uh, my question might be pretty specific. Uh, there are deaf and hard of hearing children, and when they're born, the parents are asking, you know, what do I do with my deaf or my hard of hearing child? It's better to uh, give them the cochlear implant. It's better to uh, better to uh, teach them, you know, how to speak be oral and you know under the UN convention they have a right to their first language so if they're born deaf or born hard of hearing they should be taught both whether it's American Sign Language or what what not a signed language and learned how to speak and in Sweden their model that if a child is born deaf or hard of hearing, there's a team that comes in that teaches that children and that, that child and that family to sign right away and that support is provided, which is awesome. That's a great model. And the parents and the child are you know, less frustrated because they can communicate with each other. And I guess my question, if we want something like that here, how, where do we start? Okay, who would like to respond? Archie, go ahead, please. Did you? Oh, oh okay, you were looking for someone. Others respond as well. I mean, I, I think that you make a, you know a, exactly the the right uh, point. You know, that's to be brought home to government, um, and you've stated the, the case very emphatically. Uh, I suppose that the right place to start is to put pressure on the minister who's responsible for everything from the provision of medical services uh, to community supports or the ministers um, and say that you know for uh, children born deaf or hard of hearing they need these kinds of dual supports and use the convention uh, as a, a way of uh, ensuring that government would have to tell you that they don't care if they're in breach of international human rights law put them in that position by using the text of the convention directly. I think you've made a brilliant argument. Thank you. 
Any further so comments from So you're saying our... then the ministers are where I should start with this gentleman here? I should have. <laughs> I, I, I would say very directly, don't let him out of the room. <laughs> okay, thank you. Are there any further comments? I would, again, just in terms of framing it within the context of the convention, I would frame that within Article 23 on supports to families. Uh, certainly looking at Article 6 on children, um, and there's a preamble comment about supports to families as well, and of course, uh, make sure you're engaging with the Minister in the room, but Minister of Community and Social Services and Minister of Health are probably, uh, should be equally on your horizon. I guess okay. I, I have a, a quick question back to, to you. How how well would you say uh, the deaf community is aware of the convention and how it can be used? Well, really, I feel like they don't really know too much of it. I'm here myself just to take advantage of the information here and try to, to uh, disperse it throughout the community. So uh, we're trying, like the deaf community doesn't really have a lot of accessibility. We need. We need a group to really focus on the deaf community and like I mean, maybe it's a, a hearing person with interpreters or deaf people giving presentations. I really don't think the deaf community fully understands the CRPD. So, but related to you, art, Article 29, the, inclu uh, the inclusion of community, like uh, the deaf community generally that doesn't apply to them. There's too many barriers. There's uh, Communication alone is too much of a barrier. Interpreting services, there's just not enough interpreters. Education is another factor, so it really depends. So I'm, I'm just going to leave it here. But So I think the, just, can I, can I say one more thing first? Then I need to go. <laughs> um, he's used to this. Um, I think the first thing we should do is, is, is make sure that we have some information sessions with the deaf community so that they fully understand um, how uh, the convention, that they, how they can use the convention to forward their issues and, and then go from there. Right. Okay. Uh, I'll contact you. Yep. Perfect. Go ahead. We've got five minutes left. <laughs> so uh, um, I'm going to take the question here and as I said, the one to the back. So I'd like us to be as brief as possible because... I, I just mainly want to know, just bringing up the convention isn't going to get us anywhere. I brought it up many, many times in all the battles I've had on behalf of my disabled daughter, uh, whether it's um, for a complete lack of any pediatric rehab in the province, there's absolutely nothing there for physical disabilities. I, I mentioned Article 26 on rehab. It doesn't, there's no traction there. There needs to be some legal teeth here, and you know I, I don't have the, the means to, you know, or the time or the energy to, to sue over this. Uh, neither is it something that the Human Rights Commission seems to be able to deal with. So, uh, what is our recourse? You know, we need to we need to have something simple too. We need to have like an ombudsman to fight our battles for us. We are exhausted as it is. We don't have the the, the financial means. We don't have the energy. We're just making it day by day to day as it is. So for this to be any use to us, we need to have uh, a way to very easily pass this over to someone. We just bring up the problems and someone fights the fight for us. Otherwise, I, I don't see it, it working. Okay. Um, is there anybody who would like to respond to that? I'd like to say that there are 156 of us in this room. And you know, that's a powerful voice uh, of 166 individuals. It's not, it just doesn't take one, it takes a community. It takes all of us. Human rights is about all of us taking responsibility for each other, so um, let's think about that. Any of our panel members? 
Okay, I'll move on to question at the back. I, I just, one thing I will say is that very sadly, Canada has not signed the optional protocol mm -hmm. you know, to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, yeah. which would enable individuals and groups of individuals to complain directly to the United Nations. I don't know why we haven't, except you know, as a country, I guess we're afraid of uh, the Convention actually uh, being used effectively by people like you. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's a deep shame, I think, for this yeah. country that, that we haven't signed the optional protocol, which would facilitate at the UN the receipt of communications just like the one you've brought to us. Thank you. The question, are, are you still interested in your? Okay. <laughs> now we've we've got our legal minds here, and um, a lot of contribution can. I'm going to out the Nova Scotia Commission a little bit and suggest that there is an effort underway of looking at how to harness that voice here in Nova Scotia in developing a parallel report. Um, so parallel reports, or community reports, or shadow reports, whatever you want to call them are a way that a community can pull its voice together and, and sort of say the, the realities of people on the ground. And one of the real values in that is the committee then reviews that report and when Canada is being reviewed before the committee, the committee can ask specific questions and say, what about this situation in Nova Scotia? Or what about X, Y, or Z? And they can do that regardless of whether or not we've signed the optional protocol. So that point is incredibly important. One of the challenges is that the committee is um, already estimated three to five years behind in their, um, their whole review process. One of the reasons Canada has stated that they have not signed the optional protocol is that the system for reviewing treaty body obligations is so backlogged and so delayed, there is a review underway and they would rather wait and, and engage at that time. I often think that that's a genuine answer. I often think there are some challenges uh, of not wanting to be held to account. Um, but I, I think that the, the committee is very limited in its resources. It wants cross-disability reports. It prefers national reports. So the, the double challenge for community engagement is not only how do we harness what's happening here in Nova Scotia, how do we then link that into a Canadian report that can go to the committee? And as I mentioned, the commission, and maybe Anne might talk a bit about this, um, is looking at least at taking on that Nova Scotia part, which also has great domestic uses in lobbying and, and calling on your own government to be doing things here in Nova Scotia. Yes, I, I know our, we, we, our CEO would say that we, we're trying our best to, to begin to, to start um, do, doing some work around engaging with our community and, and gathering some of that information. Uh, my um, colleague here, Jill, has spent the entire summer looking at shadow reports to get an understanding of how we can begin to make that kind of contribution. And we've been guided by um, 
Steve Este uh, in, in his work as to how to take it forward. So we, we're trying our best, we're trying to look at it, but um, it's going to take time and resource and we probably need a body. We have also estimated how much it would cost us to actually produce a report and if I'm not mistaken to, to do a task like this for about two years it will cost us a, a, about a hundred thousand dollars to have a staff member so um, there's somebody here who wants to do it so if anybody wants to volunteer to pay her then um, uh, uh, seriously I'm not making slight of it uh, it's just that we've done some initial um, inquiry into uh, and review other reports into how we the Commission can do this now, our time is going, but I really do want to take the question from here. And uh, um, I please. Have a question for Steve. Uh, what are you telling me more about Steve's photography and photo studies and expressing the lived experiences that people have been reporting about the issues? Like, what are the possibilities? Yes. I don't know if this is on. Do you hear me? Can you repeat the question? And and the the we can't get the question from Cart. So okay. can I? Is this gonna? Can you rephrase the question, Anne, so that Steve? I think she's making reference to. Uh, sorry, can I? Can you want to quickly come and, and, and mention it? Mm -hmm. I just had a question about the involvement of photo studies and photography to do with um, the expression of live experiences mm -hmm. among uh, <laughs> mental health issues and non-physical disabilities. Mm -hmm. It was a photo. It was called a, a photo voice. So, um, in our case, we we gave um, cameras to the individuals that we were working with, people with lived experience, and and they took images or pictures in their communities of what. Uh, human rights meant to them and then they interpreted it through their stories so if you take a look on the website of CMHA Winnipeg you'll see how it's depicted and uh, because we all are impacted in different ways some of us from the written word some of us uh, visually and, and quite often images are more powerful uh, than the written word and we really found that to be a, a valuable part of our project uh, that people could relate to better than our two-inch final report, right? Uh, you know, it says in a very few seconds what it means to um, be constrained or confined or not free. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to um, say a heartfelt thank you to our panelists this evening for their contribution to this very important topic. And I'll also like to, to thank you for, for being our audience tonight. We have learned a great deal from each other and hope we will continue to have this dialogue and um, work together with each other. Thank you very much.